In the previous episodes of the Western Zhou Dynasty, we've covered the prominent states of Qi, Lu, and Yan. Now, in this episode, we are going to bring our attention to the rather unique existence of the state of Chu. Now, the state of Chu was an outlier amongst all the states established during the early Western Zhou Dynasty. Instead of being founded by Zhou royalty or Zhou loyalists that followed Zhou culture and traditions, the state of Chu was founded by tribal peoples in the south of the realm. While deeply influenced by Zhou peoples and technically serving as a vessel to the Zhou throne, they would develop their own cultures and traditions deep in the southern wilderness of their time. Hello history lovers and welcome to the show where we share the myths, legends and histories of the Chinese people from the first creator to the last imperial dynasty. And here you will find more than 6,000 years of stories, one video at a time. Now to be honest, I could produce an entire series just to talk about the Chu state and the Chu people and the multiple stories that came out from the region through their 800 years of existence. But in this video, I guess I'm going to do something a bit different from the norm. So rather than focusing on a single character or a single event, I am going to compress the early years of the Chu state and the Chu people into a single video. Now, the founders of the state of Chu were said to be descendants of Zhuan Xu, the legendary Black Emperor, through the line of Zhu Rong's youngest grandson, a man by the name of Ji Lian. Over time, these people would take on the surname of Mi and call themselves the clan of Xiong. Now, Ji Lian would later go on to marry a daughter of King Pan Geng of the Shang Dynasty, and the Xiong clan would become a vassal to the Shang throne. Now, by the time of the reign of the tyrant Zhou during the late Shang Dynasty, the Xiong clan had already moved south and west into the regions between the Tan River and the Zhe River, or Tan Sui and Zhe Sui. Now, their leader of this time, a man by the name of Yu Xiong, saw that, you know, the Shang Dynasty was practically on its last legs by now, and made a politically astute decision to bring his entire clan and defect over to the Zhou under the rule of King Wen or Zhou Wen Wang. Now, there are contradicting accounts on the role that he played in the Zhou court at this time after his defection, with some saying that he was a knowledgeable man and served as kind of a teacher or mentor to King Wen, while other accounts depicted Yu Xiong as a lowly household servant in the Zhou royal family, and he treated King Wen as he would treat his own father. But that didn't really matter because their defection actually did not gain them much favor in the eyes of the Zhou royalty, as after the founding of the Zhou dynasty under King Wu or Zhou Wu Wang, the Xiong clan were neither given land to build a state nor were they rewarded for their loyalty like the many many others who were elevated during King Wu's time. Now, during the rebellion of the three guards that broke out early during Zhou Gong's regency, a branch of the Xiong clan under the leadership of Xiong Ying actually threw their support behind Wu Geng and his revivalists. And after the epic failure of a rebellion, Yu Xiong's son, a man by the name of Xiong Li, who was now the clan chief, had to lead the entire clan further south into the wilderness of the Jing Mountains or Jing Shan, which is around today's Nanchang in Hubei, to avoid and to escape the reprisal of the Zhou court. The Xiong clan would eke out an extremely hard living in brutally harsh conditions in the wilderness of the Jing Mountains, and they led an almost primitive existence compared to the flourishing civilizations in the central plains under Zhou Ru. And I guess life must be extremely, extremely hard there in the southern wilderness because by the end of Zhou Gong's regency, which lasted only seven years, the leadership of the Xiong clan had already passed to Xiong Li's grandson, this man by the name of Xiong Yi. Now, it was after Zhou Gong returned power to the throne and King Cheng of Zhou or Zhou Cheng Wang ruled personally, that he decided to elevate another batch of nobles to recognize the descendants of those who had served 
loyally during King Wen and King Wu's time. And this was when Zhou Gong reminded the throne of the Xiong clan's defection and their dedication to the Zhou cause in the early days. Now, because of that, Xiong Yi was thus granted the title of Viscount of Chu or Chu Zi and given the lands around today's Zigui in Hubei with uh, Tanyang City sitting on the north coast of the Tan River as capital of this new state which will be named the state of Chu or Chu Guo. Okay, while the Xiong clan is now finally recognized as a subject of the Zhou and given lands and titles, but if we look deeper, we'll actually see very easily what the Zhou court and the people of the Central Plains really felt about the Xiong clan and its people. Now, to begin with, the Zhou did not even try to hide their disdain for the savage and uncivilized Xiong clan. Now, by granting them the title of Viscount, they were actually amongst the lowest ranking nobles amongst all of the regional lords of the realm. And although land was given to them to build their new state, the region that they received could not even be considered a backwater of the kingdom like the state of Qi that was granted to Jiang Taikong. Now, the land given to the Chu people or the Xiong clan at this time was basically a patch of wilderness that was considered unfit for habitation by civilized people. It was only suitable for savages and barbarians. And the only tributes that the Zhou royal court required from this new state of Chu were actually mahogany bows and arrows made from native tawny bushes, both of which were items that were needed in worship rituals and for warding off evil influences. Now you might think, hey, that's mighty generous of the Zhou royal court, right? No. That was actually not a show of Zhou generosity. Instead, it was a show of how much the Zhou court and the Zhou people simply just looked down upon the Chu people. They did not believe that they could produce anything beyond simple implements that could be easily crafted from the plentiful local weeds and local woods. Now, even while facing this discrimination and this disdain, Xiong Yi would still dutifully lead his people through untold hardships to develop their lands. Now, this excerpt from the commentary of Zhuo would describe the hardships that the Chu people under Xiong Yi would face in their early days. Our revered leader Xiong Yi developed the Jing Mountains. With bamboo cuts and in tattered clothes, they went into the wilderness and crossed the mountains to serve the Son of Heaven. Mahogany bows and tawny arrows were offered as tribute for the king's use. Now, this simple paragraph will illustrate the harsh conditions that the Chu people would toil under to develop their new homeland. It will also speak volumes about the determination and the unbreakable spirits that will become ingrained into Chu culture over the next few centuries. Now imagine having to cross through the wilderness through totally undeveloped land with nothing more than cuts made out of the plentiful bamboo plants in the south and whatever woods they could salvage and not even having enough fiber or fabric to make clothes that will cover themselves properly. Keep that picture in your mind while you think about the terrains uh, that they had to go through and the difficulties that they faced to reclaim land for use in agriculture, to grow crops. And the land of the Chu state was not flat plains as you would imagine. Uh, it was basically a mixture of mountainous terrain mixed in with marshland and swamps. So yeah, no proper equipment, no proper clothing, harsh terrains, and they had to fight through all that just to establish a homeland for themselves. However, even with their dogged determination and their dutiful service, the Zhou people and the Zhou court did not change their views 
of the Chu people as being savages and barbarians, not even worthy of being viewed as equals to the other peoples of the realm. Now, according to this next excerpt from Discourses of the State or Guo Yu, the Chu people were treated extremely unfairly even during a council of regional lords. When King Cheng held the council of lords at Qiyang, the Chu people who were savages from the Jing region were tasked with setting up the sitting arrangements and putting up signboards. Together with the Xianbei tribes, they watched over the worship fire and were not allowed into the council. And this discrimination, this unfair treatment did not stop with King Cheng's reign. It extended into King Kang's reign as shown by this next excerpt again from the commentary of Zhuo. Our revered leader Xiong Yi, together with Lü Ji, the princeling Mo, Ji Luan, and Bo Qin served King Kang together. All of them received rewards except for us. Lü Ji was a son of Jiang Taigong and would take over as Marquess of Qi after his father's passing. Now, Prince Ling Mo was the son of Kang Shu and would take over his father as the Count of Wei. And Ji Luan was the son of Ji Yu, the Marquess of Jin. And Bo Qin, of course, was the son of Zhou Gong and the Marquess of Lu. While all of them served King Kang of Zhou or Zhou Kang Wang in the royal court, and I guess we can presume that they held relatively high positions to be able to serve in the capital directly under the king. Now, even so, it was obvious that the Zhou people still did not consider the Viscount of Chu as an equal to his peers. Now, this endless discrimination and the never-ending humiliation that the Zhou court and the Zhou people heaped on the Chu state and its people would spur the Chu people to develop a love-hate relationship with the Zhou kingdom. On the one hand, they were envious of the cultural and the economical advancement made under the Zhou guidance. But on the other hand, they held a deep resentment against the Zhou for their arrogance and the condescending attitude they took against the Chu. And this would spur the Chu state to go their own way in the development of their own culture and traditions, holding on to the shamanistic beliefs and traditions of their tribal past while adopting the more advanced political and governing systems of the Zhou. As a weak and lowly rank state among the Zhou vassals, their more powerful and higher rank neighbors to the north would often conduct raids into their land or simply demand unfair trade with them. Now, even the Zhou royal court would sometimes launch invasions against the Chu state. Now, you can imagine the Chu state at that time as being like the little kid that transferred to a new school in the middle of a school year and he gets picked on practically by everyone in school. So yeah, that's the situation the Chu state of that time would find themselves in. Now, tribal peoples in the deeper south and to their east would also try to drive these outsiders from their lands. And border skirmishes were common with both the civilized north and the tribal and savage south. And it was under these unforgiving circumstances externally and extremely harsh conditions internally. It was under these conditions that the Chu state would slowly grow and expand. Now we have mentioned that the original founders of the Chu state was the Xiong clan descended from Zhuan Xu, the Black Emperor. But over time, they would slowly expand southwards into the wildlands, assimilating the various tribes and clans residing in the regions around the Yangtze River and the Han Rivers, or as we call it, the Jiang Han region. Now being a Zhou vassal, they will obviously have had access to the more advanced agricultural governing and military ideas and techniques that develop in the north uh, as compared to the relatively primitive south. Now, leveraging on those advantages, the Chu people would be able to either entice the various tribes and clans of the south to join them for a better life, better productivity, more resources, 
or they could simply just invade the hostile peoples and assimilate them by force. It took five generations of relentless work, unending conflicts, an immeasurable amount of blood, sweat, and tears of the Chu people to finally establish themselves as a power in the south. By the time of Xiong Qi, who was a fifth generation descendant of Xiong Yi that we've spoken about, the state of Chu finally established themselves as the undisputed master of the south and over time the lands under Chu control will one day encompass an area as large as all the other Zhou states combined in the north. Now most of the tribes and clans of the south will later on assimilate into the state of Chu and become Chu people for all intents and purposes. Now even with their greatly expanded borders and their greatly increased numbers, the Zhou state and the Zhou people will still collectively call them or know them as the Jing Man or savages of the Jing region. Throughout the entirety of the Western Zhou period and even into the spring and autumn era, the north, the Zhou people, the central plains people, the civilized people, never got rid of their view of these southerners as savages and barbarians. Even when their borders covered almost the entire southern half of modern day China, even when they develop a culture as vibrant as anything the Zhou people could put on the table, and even when they had the military might to challenge for supremacy in the entire realm, this view of the southerners as savages and barbarians never changed. In the eyes of the civilized north, they would be grudgingly tolerated at best and would always be the savages and the barbarians of the south. Now, if you enjoyed this video, it would really help the channel out with your likes, comments, and shares. And if you feel that I've done a halfway decent job of presenting these stories and would like to contribute to the running of the channel, you can do so on Patreon. The links are available in the description box down below. And with that, my name is Apingo. I'm that Chinese history guy. And I'll see you, you beautiful people out there, in the next episode.